I'd like to welcome everyone to the Museum of Television and Radio's 12th Annual Festival in Los Angeles. My name is Ron Simon. We want to welcome you to our 12th Annual Festival. As many of you know, we salute both historic and contemporary shows. We look for programs that have exemplary cast and quality writing and direction. And no doubt uh, that one of the best shows of this year is My So-Called Life. And we're very pleased. to have the cast and production team that made that show possible. Few shows have been as realistic and as honest as this show has been to really give us a sense of what life is like in the 90s, not only as a teenager, but as part of a family. So that uh, this is a very special occasion. This, uh, the team has not gathered since the end of December uh, when um, the episode in Dreams Begin Responsibilities was uh, produced. So it's a, a reunion of sorts uh, for the cast as well. So what we're going to do, we're going to screen the pilot episode, but before that, I'd like to introduce all the people who have made this show possible. I'd like to begin with the uh, production team. First, the executive story editor, Jason Kadem. <laughs> Producer, Alan Poole. The composer of that great theme, W.G. Snuffy Walden. Co-executive producer, Scott Wyman. Co-producer, Monica Wyatt. Now for the cast of my so-called life. Best Devin Gummersall. Tom Irwin. Devin Odessa. Lisa Wilhelm. Claire Shane. Now to introduce the student, the executive producer, Ed Zwick and creator Lee Hall. Um, hi, thank you for coming. It started raining. Um, we just want to say we're so happy to be here. We haven't seen each other in a while, and that's pretty great. And um, we're showing the pilot tonight. Because uh, we are. <laughs> and um, we hope you like it. I, I have nothing to add but that the police stay around after and we'll answer questions. We just saw the pilot, and this pilot's had a long history, hasn't it? Uh, could you just take us through when, when it was made and uh, then how it got on to ABC? It was in the late 50s. <laughs> <laughs> it was the golden age of television. Hi. Uh, who remembers what, what month it was and what year it was? February of 93. I was 13. I Claire was, was, Claire was still 13. I was younger than I, I was supposed to be. And so finally when we actually started the series, you know, doing the 19 or whatever we did, um, I actually, I, I made it to 15. <laughs> <laughs> You're so old. I know, I'm ancient. <laughs> it's, it's strange because between the pilot and the first episode, which is supposed to be like just a few days, was about a year and a half between <laughs> shooting the pilot and uh, shooting the first episode. So that was a little strange. <laughs> it sometimes takes me that long to write one. Yeah. <laughs> it was interesting watching this too, seeing uh, where we've come from, uh, from this original one. This, uh, was the only uh, episode we ever shot in 35 millimeter. It was the only episode that uh, Claire is actually in every scene. Uh, it's, uh, mm. it, which is impossible to do on a regular schedule. Yeah. Uh, yet, um, it's, it's funny how we maintained the same feel considering uh, how we had to reformat it. And, you know, there was the only episode in which you got to see Angela and Sharon's relationship prior to them breaking up. It's the, those three, three or four scenes is, is all we ever did. The rest of it was them trying to repair that relationship. Winnie, what sort of research went into the making of the pilot? Uh, how did you uh, come to create the, uh, the series? <laughs> how did I come to what? Create uh, my so-called life. Well, um, a, thank you for asking me that question because the truth is, um, you know, sometimes you answer a question and then it sort of gets out of hand. Um, 
<laughs> I did not really do research for the pilot. And the reason I say that is because I think it's important for writers to talk about you know, what they really do and what they don't do. I wanted to do research. I wanted to follow teenagers around malls. I, I had <laughs> fantasies of not just visiting a school, but going back to a school, you know, um, incognito somehow. Um, <laughs> I wanted to do all those things, but finally, I have to just say that I did have to just make it up. And I want to say that because there's a lot of writers here I know, and, you know, we all, we, uh, let's just come clean that sometimes, <laughs> sometimes research is a big crock. <laughs> it's just another way to prepare procrastinate writing. But I will say this, I did, I did one little thing that was very meaningful to me, which was that I found a friend of mine was in fact a high school teacher, an old friend of mine that I'd not seen in years. And he was actually teaching at a school I wasn't interested in because it was a private school. But I said, could I just come and watch you teach one day? And I saw some behaviors in this one day that that we talked about for months. <laughs> and it was stuff like, you know, the girl who goes, the girl who's, someone's sitting behind her and she, and they're going like this with a straw in her hair and she's going like that. <laughs> and, um, and just the way it is walking down a hall and the sound of lockers. And I think what really made me do more research was when we filmed the pilot, we filmed it in actual working San Pedro High kids being told by PAs, please don't walk down that hall, they're filming. And <laughs> it was really easy for me to soak in some atmosphere. Well, I, lo I look at the pilot and I feel like I'm two. <laughs> but, um, no, she's, Angela's really, really introverted during that. And, and she, she does sort of blossom with Ryan's help and Ricky's help and other people's help. Um, and I did too, I suppose. But it's just, it's really interesting to see how the show and we as actors and the characters evolved sort of in unison. And it was just, it's really powerful now to have done as much work as we have and do as much going as we have. And, say, wow, we were two. We <laughs> 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 were together as well as individually. No, I, think, I think inevitably any, any group like this becomes a company and it, and it becomes self-reflective. It's like a repertory company or a summer stock company. It, it, it can't help when you spend this much time together and working together to become also about yourselves uh, when things are being treated by them and their work and the writers and their work so personally. That's where you're looking. You're looking inward, and you're looking at each other. Well, b both my parents aren't <laughs> psychiatrists. <laughs> um, uh, they're, both my parents are artists. But um, I can relate to, um, there's certainly a part of me that, that is like Brian. And I think that's why, um, that's why I keep staying in the show, because the writers used to be nerds, too. <laughs> um, but, Oh. No, I should, maybe I shouldn't say that. No, but um, um, but I love. Them. But anyway, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's certainly a part of me. And um, but I, but it's not exactly what I'm like. It's just sort of an extension of of a part of me. But um, I think it's it's been strange. I mean, we things happen in, in the episodes. Like we read the next script, and and that the week before something had happened to you that you know was happening in the script just by coincidence. And it's like. Maybe it's not even happening to your character, but it's happening somewhere in the script, and that happened, you know, a lot. Just and it was, it was, it makes it so so easy to act because it's it's so close to to real life. Um, I guess uh, I, I guess I would say I'm pretty close uh, to to my character. Um, I, I like to think that that's who I was when I was in junior in high school, junior high school, um, and and in, when I think of it in, in those terms, it it becomes more real to me. Um, I was a 15-year-old closeted homosexual at one point, and um, the fact that it's on the show is still amazing to me. And um, but in 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 many ways, it's very different. You know, um, I dressed very normally, thank you, and um, and he, I I am much louder and more obnoxious and arrogant than he is, and. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and he's very sensitive, and, and not that I'm not, but you know, I, I'm not that much not like him. Not sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Wilson's not sensitive. sensitive it's right. all an act. <laughs> and when he wrote that character, um, oh, uh, and, and created it, uh, it was a very bizarre thing to be asking for, to say a half Hispanic, half, half black. black, you know, sexually confused young boy to <laughs> play this role. And then Wilson just walks in. <laughs> that lucky. And the star is born. <laughs> Let's also oh also say that oh he's God. an unbelievably and remarkably talented actor in his uh <laughs> Can I say something about Wilson's similarity to um, you know, we all noticed uh, right away, was it the first rap party? Yeah, that Wilson was this amazing dancer. I mean, he told us, but, you know, so when Jason, <laughs> so when Jason Singer wrote dancer. the script about the high school dance, we wanted, to have to, we wanted to have Wilson cut loose on the dance floor, and I sort of pride myself that I tried to do that with um, Many of the characters, some, some of the characters had happened psychically and they didn't have to tell me. I just <laughs> sort of did it. But other people, I, I tried to incorporate things that were actually um, things that people had as, as talent. Is that why you wrote me getting drunk? <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd be all hard pressed to be able to uh, convince uh, a major film studio, uh, or even an independent perhaps, to do that. Uh, and not just to do it once, but to do it for 19 hours this year, or for 22 another. Um, it's an extraordinary uh, opportunity, and even I think the fact that we are able to do it, maybe even the responsibility to try to do it. Um, also, artistically, I think for all of us, I think we're savvy enough to know how many times in a lifetime do people say to you, here is this money, do whatever you want to do about whatever you want to do it without a note and without a comment. And that's the blessing and the license that we all have. And you know, the greatest uh, thing that we fear, I think, in this ending is not uh, you know, some ignominy and going on to other things in our careers, all of which we know we'll have, because I think we believe we're coming from plenty, but rather uh, losing some moment in all of our lives in which this has conspired to, you know, to combust and, and to take advantage of this opportunity that we've been given. But I, I, I keep coming back and will always come back because uh, you know, it's not just about talking about it as the movie business does and doing it once every two years. And there aren't parts like this, and there isn't writing like this, by and large, in the movies. Movies have become the province of, of uh, concepts and, and recycled uh, old television shows, <laughs> as opposed to the creations of new ones. Just, uh, 20 years. And in 20 years, maybe this too will be a movie. Um, but, but it but, could never have as good a cast again. I also think it, we should say that um, we should never diminish the power of television and what television can do just because people have uh, been abusing it lately. And I also, think it, you ha I, I also think that what happened here isn't so much a mistake, and Ed is very modest in the sense that he says that uh, the networks leave you alone and so forth, but let me tell you honestly, that's not the norm. Uh, <laughs> The reason why shows such as 30-something and Special Bulletin and My So-Called Life Get On is because Marshall Herskovitz and Ed Zwick have a mandate to do that kind of television and have the courage to go at the networks and have the courage to walk away from, from their commitments if they aren't given that freedom. I wish more people were willing to do that. I mean, he, they have given me a great gift to work and be creative as, as they have to Winnie. And uh, um, it, it wasn't, it's not what the network gave us. It's what uh, we fought for and what Ed and Marshall have fought for for many years. And people should know that.
an episode called The Zit, which was about um, <coughs> which was about vanity, and but not really. It was about self-image and self-respect, and um, and that I really related to. I think maybe because partly being in this business, looks are important, but it's just that's been really hard for me. So that I just love the way that was written. I agree. I think that was, I mean, I, I loved every single script, but I think that one stands out as my absolute favorite. It, it drew the parallel so beautifully between um, the angst of being 15 years old and the angst of being 40 years old, and that maybe the difference is a zit and lines, but the insecurity is the same. And, and I think that, you know, we've often said that if you tried to sum up the theme of the show in, in one sentence, it could be, you know, no matter how much we all change, we all remain the same. Uh, I, I guess the most difficult uh, scene during, during the, the season was uh, the episode in which uh, Scott Wynant directed uh, the Christmas episode. And it was <laughs> and uh, it was the very first scene where um, I fall into the snow and I'm crying and I'm bleeding and um, but that was that was emotionally draining because um, of the circumstances that I had to relive in order to get to that point. Betrayal um, was real tough. The um, I don't think people know the titles. You know, we, I, I know, we, I know we, that's we write what titles for ourselves, but never you know broadcast when them. Rayanne so slept with Jordan. Just uh, the loss of everything over a mistake. Um, everyone makes mistakes. And uh, Rand made a real big one. <laughs> a real big one. <laughs> and just um, losing your friends and everything kind of turning around on you. And um, just because for Rayanne, that was. So hard, because <laughs> um, she's a, a person of extremes, you know? Uh, that's why she's so fun. She's so right on that edge. She's so exciting and up. And no matter what happens to her, I mean, life threw her curveball after curveball with family and just the way she is and the way she grew up. And she just learned how to hit them. And then, um, Somebody throws a slider or something. <laughs> and, um, I don't know. It was <clears throat> stripping her down was very difficult because it took so much for me, who's very opposite of Rayanne, to uh, make her so so, so defined and uh, get that energy. And then all of a sudden, after all that of getting this energy and loving this person, and then she screws up. But you know, you got to still love this person. And it's very hard to love someone who slept with their best friend's guy. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I don't know. They were all hard. Um, <laughs> there, was an episode, there was an episode where a, um, a friend of um, Actually, it was Mary Kay Place's husband had a heart attack. That was one of the first times that uh, Graham kind of was confronted with the idea that, um, that uh, the world that he lived in really wasn't as fulfilling as um, he would like it to be, in spite of his love for his family and, and his uh, great uh, sense of happiness and security and responsibility. He also was torn between the responsibility he had to himself. And uh, they don't always go hand in hand. And uh, that's a pretty, I think he subconsciously knew it and sort of acted on it on various occasions, but that's the episode where it really hit him over the head, where he came face to face with time running out, his own mortality, and, and uh, the decisions he was going to make about it. So the, the whole episode was, uh, was challenging and was also a, a turning point for the character, I think. Uh, he made a lot of choices after that episode that uh, took him in a different direction. And then there was a very small little scene in uh, uh, the episode where they agree to the restaurant, you know. It was a scene where I actually have to call, call Patty and tell her that we've got the restaurant, we're going to start. Was this the last episode also? Yeah. yeah. And, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I had to call her and tell her with this great, you know, I had this great news and it was something that we had 
dreamt about and worked for. And then uh, this woman that I was also uh, contemplating uh, having some <clears throat> sort of relationship with was standing right behind me. And um, uh, Bess, to her great credit as an actress, actually came down to the set that day and stood next to the camera and carried on the other side of the phone conversation with me, so. She refuses I'm to sorry. leave you alone with that <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, a, a thorn between two roses, I guess. And uh, I found that uh, actually very difficult to pull off. So did I. <laughs> For me, the whole relationship thing with, you know, Angela and Sharon, especially when they finally get back together, because I lost a friend. I think everybody loses a best friend in their life. At least, at least a lot of you have, <laughs> at least from what I've heard. And it's, I think it's, it's really hard, you know, because then when you do get back together, it's, you have to rebuild like the whole, if you do. If you do, you have to, which a lot of you do, you know, I mean, like at least I did. And it was so, it's, it's so hard. Friendships, especially in high school, are so hard. And, um, and my best friend called me after that episode, the episode where we get back together, where my father has a heart attack. Um, get back together, where we get back together. Um, hmm. you know, and, and, and she was like crying. And it really, you know, it meant something to me because it's like, it's just, it's, it's, it's so real. Um, I, I found uh, this one episode um, called Life of Brian, writ written by Jason. Um, I, I, I found it really um, hard to, to, do, to do voiceovers, and I, I, I'd never done it before, and, and I really didn't. <laughs> I know, this is what I'm saying. I, I always, you know, Claire did it so effortlessly, and I was like, oh, you know, oh, I can do that, you know. And then it's like, and then you, I got a chance to do it, and it was really, it was really difficult to, um, to, to do. But um, well, you did it really well. Yes, you did. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I think, I think every, every minute of this has been, has been um, wonderful uh, for me. Even, even, you know, it's if it's been challenging, it's been, um, it's been in the right way. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just. And it's just a challenge to go like deeper and deeper into into this character and into this into the scene that you're doing, you know. I would have to say weekend because that was like my first really big part. Yeah. And uh, I guess I'd have to say the hardest part of that was having to like. <laughs> <laughs> I gave her, I gave her such a hard time too. I was like, come here, come here, give me a kiss. I gave her and such I a hard time. And I didn't. So, but then I did. All right. I'll be okay. Thanks. Thank you. It's interesting. Often, some of the, I don't want, I don't want to use the word issues, but some of the things that. Angela's going through, I haven't yet touched on in my life. <laughs> so I sort of have to imagine. And then, you know, maybe we've, it's, it's long done with. And, <laughs> and, I've, and it, it happened to me. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, no, can we just rewind, please? Can we just do it again? Because now I know what it's like. Um, so, so that's interesting. I mean, that's sort of the ups and downsides of, of being the actual age because, you know, people do it at different rates. Well, Claire is channeling several ages, so it is, <laughs> yeah. it's not and always Right easy. now I'm 40. Um, <laughs> on the other side, um, I, I think I, it's public knowledge that a lot of the, the stuff that happened with Ricky later on in the season uh, par paralleled things that happened to me. And the experience of, of reliving it and having to do it again and having to... Um, you know, just to go back to that place allowed me to cry about it again. And I hadn't, when, when I was going through it, I, I didn't want, I didn't want to feel anything, I didn't want to touch anything, I just, I just got through it. And um, doing it helped me say, I'm okay now. And it also allowed me to call up my father and say, I love you. And it allowed him to watch it and say, I didn't, I didn't know that happened, and I'm sorry. And so in that sense, it changed my life, and it allowed me to love myself more.
I mean, we really wanted to have a teacher at the school that was really trying and really was a good teacher. And, and you know, we, it was very important to, sh to us to show, you know, that aspect of it that, and, and, um, and, to, and to get, you know, sort of like the teacher's point of view that this wasn't, you know, we're not just showing the kids that, we're, you know, and we're seeing part of the plight of what it is for them to try to teach in schools now. And, so, and, and to more directly answer your question, if we were to continue, we have contemplated a very particular arc that will, absolutely. That will a actually have a, a great deal to do with student activism. That's, well, that, that would is, get all the kids involved on an yeah, activist that's, that's, level. Um, but it, it needs some time to be worked out and, and, and to be done properly. You know, the, one of the problems, but it's a wonderful problem, but one of the problems is that we don't like to do things where, you know, one episode, everyone's an activist, and then the next episode, they never, you know, they're just not an activist anymore. <laughs> Who knows why? You know, and, um, <laughs> you, know, you, the audience, decide. And it's just um, no longer active. You know, because we because we have to build everything slowly, layered in, blah blah blah. It becomes like a whole thing, and it's just harder. But you don't want to know about my problems. But, um, <laughs> but I, I do want to I do want to mention something, which is which is off what you were saying about you going back to your old school. But remember when we were shooting in San yeah. Pedro, and there were signs everywhere, you know, no guns, you know, X guns. And all the kids would say to us, the San Pedro kids, not our kids, the San Pedro kids would say, well, what is all your set dressing doing here? And it wasn't set dressing. It was just that they didn't realize that the posters had gone up that semester. You know, mm. they, you see what I'm saying? And they call the series dark <laughs> and depressing. Yeah. Uh, um, it, it's very difficult for me <laughs> because we actually switched high schools when we started the series, and we are now shooting at my high school. So for, for me, I am revisiting the same Apple machine that I went to when I was in high school. I mean, Scott would say to me, that's where I got beat up. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. It was. <laughs> and, and the strangest thing is that there are teachers in, the, in school that were there when I was at school. Well, you have to. You have to understand. It was our decision. It's, it, yeah. Would, would, <laughs> Which time slot shall I choose? You know, part of the difficulty is that is is exactly what the strength of the show is. That I think it's the only show on now that is um, multi generational. You know, truly multi generational, and so sort of wherever you contemplate putting it um, limits part of the audience. Um, you know, 8 o'clock is simply too early for most people my age. Everyone I know wants to watch the show, but they're putting their kids to bed. Or making dinner. Or they're trying or to get home homework. from work. And, yeah. and, you know, if you put it on later, everybody I know who has teenagers goes, oh, you can't put it on later. You yeah, just except, can't. You know? See, I think every teenager I know right. <laughs> yeah. is up after I've gone to sleep. And that 15-year-old up there, I think you, sh you know, <laughs> it's 9 o'clock. And it's a Thursday, girl. you got to Thursday, it's a school night. <laughs> You know, it's so funny. I think we work so hard to define or to defy the category. Uh, we work, we've seen so much on television, so we work very hard to do something new. But, you know, I think in some ways what we're doing is not all that revolutionary. What we are trying to do is get back to legitimate storytelling. And what would inspire me would be the uh, programs from the, uh, the 50s when uh, great writers Patty would do anthology series uh, where the greatest writers of, of, the, of, the, of the Broadway stage were writing for television and there were no limitations. There were, you didn't have to draw a gun or be part of a detective agency or, or you know, fight crime or, or be in a hospital, or have a franchise. The truth is, is that they were telling stories about the human condition. And so if I was to look back at, at, at television that existed before, I would go that far back to, to the old anthology series. I mean, I'm sure I have something to say, but I, I'm inspired by what television is capable of. I mean, I'm inspired by communicating with people. Yeah. This inspires me, and, and television is a great, great tool that I consider untapped. I mean, television is the great intimate communicator. You know, you go to a movie, it is not 
you know, I, except for the Brady Bunch movie, which I actually found a, a, an inspiring experience because everybody in the audience understood every joke the same way. <laughs> you know, but except for that, these movies are not, you know, possible exception of Pulp Fiction, these are not community experiences. These are isolated experiences that eventually end up on TV anyway. Television is, the, is now the intimate experience where you can come into someone's home, fill them with an emotion, and they can be rendered, you know, open-minded or changed from what you put on television, if, if you put it there.